The soundtrack of my youth sounded a lot like this. You all recognize that. Okay. Played a lot of this growing up. Rad Racer Contra, but this was my, one of my favorites. Because it was one of my favorites, I uh, always got excited to go to my Aunt Dorothy's. My Aunt Dorothy lived in the, turn this down, my, my Aunt Dorothy lived in that northern part of Florida that was a lot more like Georgia than it was Orlando. You know where they drew the line wrong? They should have just called it Georgia. And uh, she lived down there. I was like, always excited to go down there. My, we went down there to the backwoods in Cross City and on hundreds and hundreds of acres of land that my aunt and uncle Roy and Dorothy Skinner owned, the Skinnerosa it was called, and um, I wasn't excited because I was going down to spend a week with my uncle Roy, uh, the consummate outdoorsman, Did, not going to go, I wasn't excited because we were going to go out into the woods and enjoy the woods, and I should have. No, I wasn't excited about that. I wasn't excited to be with my Aunt Dorothy, who uh, just set the most amazing table. You'd show up, and, and she'd set the table, and there'd be scallops there that had been swimming a few hours earlier, flash fried and on the table for you, and, and okra. You all eat okra up here, and it ain't right. You got to eat okra down south where they know what to do with it, right? And, and sit down at that table, and she'd serve you deer or bear or whatever she, it was in the freezer, and uh, I wasn't excited about that. I was excited because I went down, this is in the late 80s, remember, and I got to play Mario Brothers on a big screen. Back when a big screen meant that if it was six foot tall, it was about six foot deep, but I got to play Mario, and Super Mario, the guy was like that tall. It was awesome. We would go down every couple years, and uh, I remember one time we went down, and my, uh, someone had given my aunt, they'd found a deer, a baby deer that was injured, and they'd given it to my aunt. And so she'd raised the deer, and bottle fed it in the house, and then built a pen. She named it. You know what happens when you name, yes, his name was Jem, and once you name the deer, that's it. It's part of the family. And so uh, she named the deer, and uh, every time we went down, that pen, it kept, just, just kept on getting bigger. That pen, we, we, we'd go down, and she had gem, and then garnet, and then sapphire. You sense the theme there. And then she had another pen for the buck, and uh, yeah. I went down there, and, and, and thank God, I eventually I stopped worrying about the video game so much, and I sp spent some more time with my aunt. We'd go out there and, and feed the deer, and uh, my aunt was a woman of few words, and, and she was always doing something, so you just went to do things with her. And uh, I'd watch as she would lean over. One time she leaned over to cut the 50-pound bag of feed, and a deer ran up behind her silently, right? Just ran up behind her and stopped and got up on its back legs, reached out and tapped her, and then ran. They were playing with her, right? They, they, she went out morning and afternoon cutting up uh, vegetables for them, and, and she would go out to feed the deer, and they would play with her. And, uh, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, my, yes, my Uncle Roy shot deer, but he shot those deer out there, not, not my aunt's deer in, in, in the pen, obviously. Um, like, those deer, they'd come up to... My, my mom told me about... Uh, she went down more often than I did. She would go down and the, the buck, she told about the times like the buck would come up and it would need help rubbing the fuzz off its antlers. And so that, that's an impressive thing to, for a buck to come up and, and want you to do that. One of the times I was lucky enough, I was down there and I was, uh, I was looking for the deer, big pen, and I knew they were back there by the water somewhere and my aunt was getting some uh, more feed. And as I stand there looking for them, I felt something on my shoulder. And I felt something on my other shoulder. I looked. Now his nose to snout. <laughs> Amazing moment to be that close to a deer just looking at you. <laughs> I look back at the time I spent in those years and the time my Aunt Dorothy spent. I wish I'd spent more time like my Aunt Dorothy. She, while I was playing video games or watching TV, she was uh, making peace with deer. Of the two of us, I think she was probably the one with a wiser use of her time. It does become a question. You look at the, the saints of the church and you see what can be done and you think, what, what can I do? Well, how do I spend my time? Looking of, uh, thinking back on my aunt and her dear makes me look around and think about the possibilities. 
if my aunt could have the patience and devotion to make peace with deer, what might I do? What might I do? This is not something she began as a teenager either. This is something that happened that someone dropped the deer off. She was in her 40s. And this is not something she started as a young woman. This is something that happened later in life. And if she could make peace with deer, even at that age, uh, what, what might I be able to do with, with my life at, at my age, right? Today is uh, All Saints. Today is the t this is our celebration of All Saints, the Sunday that is closest to Halloween. And uh, you say, Halloween, what's that have to do with All Saints? Halloween is what happens, is the word you get when you say All Hallowed Evening. Again and again and again and again and again and again and again. All hallowed evening, you say it fast enough, it turns all, all hallowed evening turns into Halloween. And, and uh, so all hallowed evening, hallowed is the past tense of holy. So all those who have been hallowed made holy in its past tense because they're gone, they have died. So all hallowed evening is the night before all saints, when the time when we remember and we celebrate the lives of the saints. So we, it's uh, November 1st is All Saints, and uh, it is the day upon which we look at the people we have known and we see what God has done in their lives. I believe that in the patient love my aunt showed for every guest who walked in the door, combined with that patient love and devotion she had for her dear, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about love is kind and, and, and patient, and I, I can think of no better example of that. Even when her body became weak, when she was undergoing chemotherapy, she was still going out there morning and afternoon to care for her beloved deer. One of the times I was down there, as we were going out to care for the deer, she had her two uh, bags of feed, 50-pound bags of feed, and, and she looked at me and said, Andy, if, uh, if you can only carry one, feed, one bag, that's okay. I'll be darned if I'm only going to carry one bag of feed when she carries two and she has stage four multiple organ cancer. <laughs> Male pride. Whew, yep, I found it that moment, right? <laughs> I carried my two bags of feed and we went out to feed the deer to be at peace with the most skittish uh, of animals. All right, even when her body became weak, she was always doing that. If God can do that in the life of my Aunt Dorothy, what can God do in my life and what can God do in yours? As we watch the lives of the saints, we see that we can trust God to dare to trust that peace can be made, that God's will can be done. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God, is how Jesus puts it. And to live lives of peace and peacemaking, to dare to trust that there are indeed possibilities that God can still do the unexpected. That the same Lord who told a hundred-year-old Abraham that he would have a son can still be trusted to do surprises and have possibilities, possibilities in us, possibilities that we have seen in the lives of the saints, those who have been hallowed and gone before us. To be clear, a saint is not someone who is special because they have some extraordinary patience or willpower or vision. A saint is someone who is special because they have welcomed God's patience, willpower, and vision into their lives. They have wrapped their dreams into God's dreams, their hopes into God's hopes, their desires into God's desires. And so All Saints is, it's not about worshiping people, it's about worshiping the Lord who makes such saintly lives possible. It's to trust that there are possibilities for a different future, to trust that God can be at work in our lives, that is the gift of the saints. Not to talk about things in the abstract, but be able to talk to people and see it lived. It is the lives of the saints that inspire and make our lives possible. I know this because it is true for Olivia and I. Olivia's great uncle John is one of God's saints. A teacher, devoted, passionately devoted to his, to his students. And Bavir, the, uh, John Amade, he was someone who understood that if a student comes in and fails a test, that's a problem for the student and for the teacher. Because as a teacher, it is your job, your calling, your passion to love that child until they understand what they need to know. It is his life that made it possible for how many teachers are in Olivia's family? I lose track. His life made their lives possible. John Ward was, uh, the, did that for me. John Ward was a pastor on the East Coast. 
Let me tell you something about seminary. You go to seminary in your first year, you're confused. Ah, right? You're just in over your head. The second year, you start understanding. You start reading the call of the prophets to uh, the call of God to live a holy life. And you look at the call of the prophets and the, the commands of Jesus, and you look at the church that, that claims to follow that, and you start to get bitter. There are a lot of very bitter second-year seminary students. I was one of them. Ask Olivia sometime. All right. uh, it was John Ward, who had retired from serving the church for decades, who, who drank coffee with me and helped me see what it looks like to follow a perfect Lord in an imperfect church. I'm able to love the church because John Ward showed me how. Carmen Ward, his uh, wife, Carmen Ward, was a, a, mu a music educator, a teacher, and, and had followed uh, John. And uh, Olivia and I were invited to her table, and, and she helped us to show us what it looked like to be married. Right? We, we knew we could be married, but like, there are some, we knew there were going to be some challenges. You may have noticed Olivia is Catholic and a music teacher. Right? And music teachers tend to settle down and stay at so, school for a long time, and Methodist pastor as well. Right? So to sit down at Carmen Ward's table and to hear about their gallivanting all over Africa with children, to hear about her travels with her husband. You know, Olivia knew that she could teach. I knew I could be a pastor. We knew that we could be married in the abstract. To see it in the lives of the saints, the people who had faithfully followed Jesus Christ in their lives, they had done that. They had been made holy in the following of Christ and doing those things. It's one thing to talk about in the abstract. It's another thing to drink the coffee who have done it so you can see, see them and say, yes, I can do that too. Christ has been faithful with them, and Christ will be faithful with me. Now, that is not to gloss over reality. The saints are people. They live in the same brokenness that we do. The, when what the saints show us is God is still working even in the midst of the brokenness. In my Aunt Dorothy's life, there were hard moments. She did not live a perfect or easy life. For the most part, those are not my stories to tell. Suffice it to say, there are reasons that my family, the Fletchers, Scattered, did not see each other often for many, many long years. The one place my family could gather was at my Aunt Dorothy's house, at the Skinnerosa, the place where she made peace with deer is where my family could find peace with itself. I don't think that's accidental. When my Aunt Dorothy was going through the th chemotherapy for the cancer that would eventually kill her, all the family started gathering far more often to help her, help her, and help her take care of those deer. And in doing so, in gathering around my aunt, my family started to find some peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. That is her legacy. It took years for my family to be at peace with itself, but it also took years for her to make peace with the deer. Such things take time. But we can see how it's possible in the lives of the saints who take the time to make that peace. We look to the saints to have a foretaste of the feast of what is to come, a taste of what we see in the book of Revelation, which gives us a glimpse of all the saints gathered together as we see the end of our stories as followers of Jesus Christ. When we look to the saints, we see the possibilities of what God can do between now and that day to come, of that kingdom to come in heaven when we are gathered with the saints who have gone before us. I live each day remembering my aunt, and I can say that I remember her because every day I cook in her skillet, her eight-inch cast iron skillet. As she loves so many with that, her cooking, with her, that tool, I, I, that's how I love my family. That's how I love every guest who walks in the door. If I ever feed you, you can know that you are eating on my Dorothy skillet, and I'm loving you as she, taught me, as she taught me to love, as she taught, as she practiced her entire life. Seeing the patience and the vo devotion that make, what that takes and what it can do to make peace possible with her dear and with my family, has made it possible for me to seek to build such peace in my life. It makes me ponder, what is the peace that I can build here? 
We each receive the gift of time. I pray that each of us take that gift and use it as the saints who have gone before us have, to use it for the making of God's peace, inspired by them, by what we have seen, what we know is possible.